revolutionary talk for revolutionary times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm. Welcome to Living the Solution with Dr. Elena George. Today I have a very special colleague on, and I'm really happy I'm able to have her back on so quickly. But I think this is an emergency podcast, frankly. Um, this is Dr. Kristen Held. She is the president of the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons and somebody who's on the front line paying attention, honestly, to what's going on. We have this COVID crisis that's happening, but I think we're not looking at the big, we're looking at the big picture, but not really what's going on on the ground. And I think Chris has a real finger on the pulse of our healthcare system. We've actually had, and I want to get your take on this, Chris, where it's all about COVID, but if you don't have it or you're healthy and you actually have an underlying medical problem, you're actually on the outside looking in. It's like people, like you don't exist anymore. And people aren't paying attention to that. If we continue the way we are, I think we're damaging the health of thousands of Americans, if not millions, who need to see their doctor, who can't get in, who if they try to go to a hospital, they're turned away because they don't have symptoms, so to speak, of COVID. What are we doing? You know, I really agree with you. I think what we're doing is we're crea- we're losing the forest to the trees. We're very short-sighted. And I think we're creating a second and third public health crisis. Um, number two is that all of these patients that are not coming in for their routine care, care of their diabetes, their hypertension, and patients that are putting off surgery because it's not being deemed urgent or emergent, you know, they start out. I, I have, a, have a friend who said her brother was supposed to have a four-vessel bypass. That was deemed non urgent and he's put off. What if he has a heart attack in the meantime? What if he dies? Um, patients who have need a stent and then if we put them off, then they're going to need surgery. Or I've had patients tell me that they were supposed to have a mastectomy. Cancer patients, this is put off. Now, what if later down the way, now they're a, a, they're, they have metastatic disease? So we're creating problems. So not only are we creating a backlog, but we're having people go without care, go untreated and develop worse problems than they would have because they're, we, we right now are denying their care. The, the third problem that we're creating is we are putting doctors, nurses, surgery centers and hospitals out of business. I have a dear colleague I spoke to last night. He called me, he said, Chris, what are you doing? Because I had shared with him what's happening to me under Governor Abbott's uh, executive order uh, with the medical board, the Texas Medical Board, uh, saying you cannot do any surgery that is elective at all. It must be urgent. It must be emergent. And uh, we can talk about that. But my call, and we'll go back to that. But my colleague said, you know, I'm an internist. I don't operate. But our hospital is about to go under. He said without surgery supporting it, patients coming in, outdoor, outside referrals, and with this philosophy of keeping beds open, they are not able to make their overhead. He said if they let everyone go in the whole hospital, they'll still be underwater because they're not bringing in enough revenue. So his rural hospital is about to go out of business. And I said, you know, how many doctor cases of COVID have y'all had? They've had four in the whole hospital. Wow. (laughs) So for patients, we're losing the hospital, we're losing the nurses, the surgeons, the doctors. It really makes you wonder about the sense. Where's the common sense? And, um, you know, in, in Bear County, where we are, we have two million people. Uh, as of like yesterday, we'd had 20 deaths. I think now we've had like 30. Well, that's like one in a hundred thousand. And I understand that this is a real problem and that it's crescendoing. Mm-hmm. I think we're very blessed that we have not had more, but we had it not very long ago, 50% of our hospital beds open. 400 ICU beds open. Yet as a surgeon, I have a, I'm, I'm an ophthalmologist, so I have a LASIK center. I've got three full-time employees, expensive equipment, rent. I cannot do one case. So for a month, I have 
no income, complete expenses. You know, we're trying to get one of these small business loans, but we're very close to just saying, okay, you know, the laser center's wash. That's mm-hmm. a loss for community. Mm-hmm. Um, surgery center, 76% of the nurses have had to been outsourced um, from the ambulatory surgical center. Um, the uh, colleague I have, an orthopedic surgeon in Texas, has been targeted by the medical board. And on, you know, here's the thing, Dr. George, you know this. The CDC, Centers for Disease Control, makes, and the federal government made some recommendations. Right. The states, because we're a republic, the federalists, the states then took those recommendations and many of the government governors transformed them into executive orders, which then got be made into law. So in Texas, when Governor Abbott, who I love and has been wonderful, a freedom loving and depending, defending governor, mm-hmm. when he gave orders and gave the gave the orders to the Board of Pharmacy and the medical board to put into action, the Texas Medical Board went to town and they made these rules and put into law with great punishment that if you operate, if you're a surgeon and you operate and it is not urgent or emergent, you must be reported. They did mandatory snitching, mandatory reporting on the doctor. Wow. No process. You are immediately investigated. You are sub, you, you are deemed a threat to like public welfare. You're lumped in with like serial child sex offenders and you are, uh, subject to license, losing suspension of your license, restriction of your license, license, and immediate report to the Phys- National Practitioner Data Bank and up to 180 days in, days in jail and a thousand dollar fine. That's crazy. That's Sir? criminals get better treatment than that. Let's get better treatment. And yeah. so this gen got three reports by someone at a surgery center he was working at. So he has to, and, and so that rule was made March 24th by one, by the end of the week, he had gotten reported. They were on this and now he's subsequently been reported again. And he's a wonderful doctor and he documented in the chart. One of them was a displaced ankle fracture. Yeah. So the, they have to operate the, on that. Yes. So the Texas Medical Board investigator called his office, said we're investigating him, and he had to hire an attorney. So now not only is he not operating, he's having to spend my money and defend himself. So this needs to go. Um, and the pharmacy board, what the pharmacy board did was they restricted us as physicians. And this is the other issue from our ability to prescribe. We can prescribe all we want. But the pharmacist can refuse to fill our prescriptions. So now we as the physicians of our country, of our state and our country, the government is now keeping us from getting medications to our patients and operating on our patients. Our practices are closing down if we're private practitioners and our surgery centers and our hospitals are at risk. It's, it's quite an interesting time when we're in the midst of a pandemic. Oh, I agree with you. It, it's one of those. I, it's, I'm actually speechless, actually, because we're on the front line. And let's take a break because I want to discuss this in more detail. People don't understand that the people they're getting rid of, trying to, are the ones that give the most individualized health medicine, health care, the most cost effective, the most accessible, and the ones that can actually be the front line so people don't have to go to the hospital if they had COVID, right? So they're getting rid of the actual infrastructure, which per- perhaps may never come back. You cannot be replaced by AI. You can't be replaced by robotics. You can't be replaced by, you know, um, mid-level providers. And when they figure this out, this is going to be a catastrophe for our country, our healthcare system, and our patients, most li- you know, which is most important. On that note, let's take our first break. You're living in the solution. Welcome back to Living the Solution. We're here speaking with Dr. Kristen Held, the um, president of the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons, an advocate for patients, a forward-thinking pioneer, quite frankly, and a warrior in the fight 
to fix our healthcare system and to save our patients. And I hope, edu- hope along with you, educate the people who are making these decisions, which are ridiculous. So my first question on the way back in is, were there any doctors asked about the out, you know, the fallout from these executive orders? Who did they use to just the CDC top down or did any physicians are, were they involved with this? Well, you know, that's a really good question. Um, certainly on the pharmacy board side, I, if you look at the law, they gave, I, I laugh and say they gave everybody and their mom the ability to put out and dispense meds. You know, they upgraded pharmacy tax. You know, you were talking about mid-levels. Everyone except physicians. In Texas, we still don't have, we still have a ban on the ability to do in-office dispense. So that is, I thought, wow, what a great time to get physicians for in-office dispense. Nope. They empowered everyone except for us. So that was a done deal. Mm-hmm. And as far as the surgery side, you know, our, t- our medical board does have some reasonable doctors on it, but it also has non-doctors and they did it through an emergency executive session. And I think they're so short sighted. They're more interested in, you know, like demonizing and keeping a couple, you know, uh, you know, doctors from doing certain things that mm-hmm. they're willing to just put all of this very onerous law on us. We've lost our freedom to practice Hippocratic medicine. And, and you and I, you know, you are just such a, a, you know, colleague of mine that I just, we, we believe the same things. We believe that we are doing this for our patients. We, there's, we're at a philosophical divide. When you and I trained, it was all for the patient. Um, we did everything within our power and, you know, we, we, trained our lives and we we have this knowledge and wisdom and we can look at patients and we know what they've got and we know what they need and but yet we have the humility to know that we don't know everything and we'll find it out and we'll learn and there's always new things like with this covid Mm -hmm. Uh, but like you said with this new ai and this and that there's this whole new breed of top town top down authoritarian medicine where they want you to just follow algorithms and Think about how we prescribe. The FDA puts medications out. Well, 20% of the time or more, we're using them for off-label use. We we understand how the medication works. It's expensive. They, mm-hmm. they put it out for efficacy and safety, and, and we use it. Well, all of a sudden, when it looks like we have possibly a low-cost, low-risk, drug that we could theoretically use early to keep people from having to go to the hospital off the ventilator to keep them from getting sick. Right. There's this pushback because it quote unquote doesn't have a um, indication. Well, how could it have an indication for COVID-19 when there was never COVID-19 before <laughs> a couple of months ago? That's a great so, point. And we're back to nonsense. But there is a history with this drug. If you go back to 2003 and look at the literature in JAMA, there's an article exploring the the biochemistry, the science of this drug that shows that it may be effective against coronaviruses or SARS type viruses. And so now we have a new one that looks like it's a splicing Mm -hmm. between a SARS and a MERS and an HIV. Well, this Mm -hmm. might help, but you have to start it early. Now, it's interesting that the drugs that they we can't wait a year for a vaccine yeah. without anything. Just let people die. We can't wait a year for a new antiviral. We need to use what we've got now. And that's mm-hmm. most important, our brains, our ability to treat our patients individually. We can't wait till the tests are positive. The tests come positive late. We need to get them early when they're symptomatic. And, you know, most of the time you and I are able to make a diagnosis based on a clinical exam a history and a physical, we don't go, well, wait, let me get a test and see if it's yes or no. Exactly. Exactly. Not, <laughs> it, is. it doesn't make sense. I mean, sense. let's go back. Let's talk about that drug for a minute. And we're talking about hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil. That is being used technically as an off-label, right? It's used for rheumatoid arthritis. It's used for inflammatory bowel disease. It's used for everything. And it was started off as a malaria drug. So their argument that it's only used for one thing is it's not true. There's so much misinformation. It's not even funny. So much misinformation. And you know what's ironic is hydroxychloroquine, the, chloroquine, the malaria drugs, they used to be over the counter. Oh, wow. And they were over at the counter. And if you look historically, if you look back to George Washington, 
he used cin- cinchona for the American troops. They had it, and that is the precursor of quinine or chloroquine. We had it. The British didn't, and they think it contributed to our ability to win at the Battle of Yorktown and become the United States of America. If you look at Sir William Osler, the doctor's doctor, um, he wrote an article in JAM in 1896 where he said the three greatest scourges of man, and if you look in the Bible, this is what it is, mm-hmm. are fever famine and war, the worst being fever. And he said the greatest three um, abil- abilities for medical and physicians to take care of their patients were aseptic, te- aseptic technique, number three, you know, hand washing, getting rid of childbed fever, passing disease, right. vaccines. And guess what he said number one was the ability to fight malaria and fever with cinchona. What is cinchona? We've had we've had the, the parents of hydroxychloroquine for centuries now used to be over the counter. I'm an ophthalmologist. Now you as an ENT, you'll see people that potentially maybe have some tinnitus or problems and bringing in the ears from it. I see people every day of my practice for years who to check their retinas for potential toxicity um, from Plaquenil and it's, which is hydroxychloroquine. Rarely do they have it. And these are people that take a low dose to a pretty hot, you know, 200 milligrams a day for years. The doses that we're talking about being useful in outpatient are that low or lower. And the other problem, potentially prolonging uh, the the QT interval in the heart, that's very rare. In fact, my friends that are rheumatologists and yours that prescribe hydroxychloroquine routinely do not routinely get a baseline EKG because it's so rare at those doses. And I, in fact, know a lot about that because I have five immediate family members who have congenital long QT syndrome. So I'm innately, innately familiar with this and have spoken with one of the world experts, uh, Michael, Dr. Michael Ackerman, about QT mm-hmm. and there are guidelines to use it. So th- there's three lies that they're saying. They're saying, one, it's um, not available. Well, we can make it. We can make it quickly and cheaply, and that's a whole other thing we could talk about. Mm-hmm. But right now, if anybody's hoarding it, it's the from the national stock. They donated 30 million pills up to New York, mm-hmm. and they're reserving it for hospitalized patients when it's too late. That's a problem. So oh, we've had all this time. They could make more. The second thing they say is that it needs to be just reserved, you know, for the rheumatoid and and uh, lupus patients, but we could make it for everyone if we wanted to. The second thing they say is it's too risky, but it's not. We just talked about that. At the low doses, it is not. It has a high safety profile. It's risky at the horrific doses. They're setting it up to fail when they're waiting till inpatient. And some of the studies I've seen, they, they're giving it at super high doses. Well, mm-hmm. anything given five times the normal amount mm-hmm. is present with toxicity. And then the third thing they'll say is, well, we need to reserve it for hospitalized patients. We'll wait. When this COVID-19, when you're in the hospital, you're in, you're in big trouble. True. You are in big trouble. Your lungs are decompensating. You needed to be treated with something before you got to that point when you're needing a ventilator, when you're needing a hospital bed. This is America. We can do better as doctors. You and I can do better. And if we make a clinical diagnosis, we should be able to offer that patient a low cost, accessible, proven medication that evidence is showing may help. And if you look at evidence from India and all around the world, exactly. they're using it in healthcare workers and high risk patients, and they're having good results, keeping people out of the hospital, keeping from needing ships and tents and all sorts of things, you know? Yeah, it's it doesn't make if they'd asked us, the doctors on the front line, we would have made a different choice in how this rolled out. And I agree with you. First of all, it should be always about choice. Not everything fits everybody. A vaccine is not going to fit everybody. Res, re, was it resenivir or res, the mm-hmm. yes. Yes. It, that's not going to work for everybody. Hydroxychloroquine may not work for everybody, but you need to have the array of different treatment options and to demonize doctors and make them criminals for doing what we train to do. There is no doctor in this country, in the world, who will put a patient on a medication and not look at safety first. Nobody. And I think that's offensive in its, the whole rollout of that, that, that theory, that we're going to hurt our patients. Patients cannot get it over the counter. It's not like you're going to go, 
online and take this stuff. You know, I mean, you're not going to be able to do it. So if they had bothered to ask, I think we would have had a different approach, which uh, before even the testing came out to be able to see your patient, make the diagnosis, write the prescription so they don't end up in the hospital. How much money would that save the entire country? Can you imagine? I mean, they're doing the most expensive iteration, aren't they? Yes, they really are. And so, and, and our lives and our livelihoods and our jobs and our, our interaction with our loved ones and our elderly, you know, closing down around us when we could have implemented a study, you know, if they say, well, we need a study, well, then let's do one. Let's do it with appropriate doses. Let's do it before it's too late when it's shown to work. Now, one of the things that's interesting, you know, when you think about these drugs, remdesivir, okay? So our medical school, our university here in town is part of the remdesivir study. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, why would people want to be part of that? Well, look at the, these numbers. NIH gave a grant to Columbia University. Guess how much money they get for studying remdesivir? $32,650,000. Mm. Um, look, look at this one. Vanderbilt got four million two hundred thirty-five thousand. UNC Chapel Hill three million three point seven eight million. Um, University of Alabama thirty-four million nine hundred. Now, would you rather do the study where you got thirty-four million or do the one for free with hydroxychloroquine? Um, That's an easy from, question. It's you know you don't you don't even have to do the study. You would just allow doctors to prescribe the medication to follow their patients. And there's an interesting thing. I watched Dr. Oz and he mentioned that he talked to a rheumatologist who takes care of people on Plaquenil, uh, hydrochloric, hydrochloroquine. None of his patients have gotten COVID-19. How interesting is that? Ask the rheumatologists across the country, do a, a, a study on their patients. It's a captive audience. All you have to do is a chart review and what they're doing clinically, you would know whether or not that's an interesting, if none of those patients got it, there's something to be said. And if yeah. you <laughs> go ahead, they don't have the side effects, they aren't having this. Correct. Heart, you know, they're, they're the people that are getting that or when they're waiting till they're in the hospital and putting them on massive doses. So the misinformation is doing a disservice to the American patient. Demonizing us doesn't help. We no. love our patients. Stop trying to keep us from taking care of them. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. And when you look at the science, if you take the hydroxychloroquine and you combine it with zinc yep. and then even azithromycin and antibiotic, there's you, you can understand why it works on the cell to stop the virus from replic- replicating. And, um, you know, we as physicians, we, you know, we had to start out with our undergraduate and medical school and internship and training and residency. We get it. It's, um, you know, it's we see this and we need to be allowed to I just can't believe this is where we are in the United States of America right now with our freedom to practice Hippocratic medicine. I can't believe it either. I think this is a wake up call on this show is about changing the paradigm, in my opinion, because we've been under siege. It's been driven by fear. And when you have fear, your brain completely turns off. I mean, I'm talking to friends I haven't talked to in years who are like, this doesn't make sense. Something is wrong. I'm just not following this. And I don't blame them because we're seeing it's like a cognitive dissonance almost where they're telling us how bad this is, but the numbers don't bear it out. And let's talk about that when we come back, because I wanted to get your take on what the CDC and the and the WHO have said about testing and how we count people, because I think it's all all in alignment. Let's take our next break. You're living the solution. Welcome back to Living the Solution. We're speaking with Dr. Kristen Held. And before the break, we were talking about the numbers. This is something that doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm a New Yorker initially. And has this thing rolled out where they allowed, you know, they started to lock down the cities, but they still allow the the trains and the buses to run. Uh, That made no sense to me. If this is passed, if it's communicated in such a way that it's airborne and it, it can affect people, then if you look at the numbers, many thousands of, of New Yorkers should have been infected by this. And that really didn't bear out. They didn't shut the major um, locations where people would be right on top of each other down either. So that didn't make a lot of sense. Now we're talking about the different codes. WHO has now two codes for clo- coding COVID-19. One says, oh, you've been diagnosed with it. It's documented. And this other code says you can say that someone died of covid but you don't have to document that they actually had it. No testing is done. You just presume it. 
What's your take on that? Well, the numbers, I, I, you know, I think it does go back to fear and a mind game and perpetuating. Um, they're not comparing apples to apples. The denominators are not the same. You know, how all of a sudden, and, and what you're finding is like all of a sudden everybody's dying of COVID, but nobody's dying of a heart attack or anything. Exactly. You know, oh, if you get COVID, does it protect you from everything else? No, they're playing a numbers game. And it makes you be very distrustful, not only of China, of course, but of WHO. And, you know, if you look at it, you're, you know, you're, you're so right about it. no one else is like New York City. They have 27 million people and 3.5 square miles. I'm in Texas. We have a huge state. We have 28 million in the whole state. We have a different scenario. Houston is going to be different than Loving County, where we have one person for every five miles. You know, yet we're doing the same thing, shutting down the whole state. Right. I'm, it, it, it's nonsensical. And it's interesting, like you were saying in New York, with that many people, that population density, and so many people living in apartments, breathing the same air and all that. I mean, honestly, I'm shocked that it's not worse than it is. I feel for these dense cities. I feel for Detroit. I feel for Chicago. I feel for, you know, Houston, Dallas, mm -hmm. Austin. San Antonio is a pretty big city. We're, we're Bear County, one of, we're one of the harder hit counties around here, but it's still not like it could be. And um, yet we're shut down. And the numbers are dropping. So even yeah. if you added in these and I don't think they should be counted because they're not actual confirmed cases. You're adding those in now because I think they're trying to gin the numbers up, in my opinion, and the numbers are still dropping. So at this point, where I'm seeing other things happen in the country that are very disturbing. Out of California most recently, you can't stream church. You can't stream music from your church, but you can, you're not with anybody. You're being picked up for paddle boarding by yourself. A little child shooting baskets by herself is getting picked up. What is going on? Is this something, you know, we're talking about medical tyranny, but it's going social as well. And I don't think there's enough proof that this is necessary, especially if the numbers are dropping. What's your take on that? I totally agree with you. It's heart-wrenching. They are destroying the very fiber of... Yeah, speak up. They're, they're, destroy, they're destroying the very fiber of what it means to be an American and to be a community and to be free, um, free to worship together, mm -hmm. free to commune together. And they're tearing us up and, and uh, it's changing things. You know, um, in, the, in, a, in a book I love called A Miracle That Changed the World, um, the 5,000 year late principles of freedom 101. The 27th principle is the burden of debt is as destructive to human freedom as subjugation by conquest. And they have taken this and they've destroyed our economy, our families. We, we couldn't get together on Easter with our parents and grandparents and grandchildren and children. We couldn't go to church. We are losing our jobs. We've lost our jobs. Um, this is very concerning. You have to worry about a long game being played by socialists or worse that are using medicine, using our profession to transform our country into what it was never intended to be. And I'm so sad. And I think we have to, as physicians and patients, stand up. And the problem is half of us now, you and I are not, but half of us are employed yeah. and afraid of retaliation, retribution, losing our jobs. And we cannot be afraid. No, I don't think so. I think a conversation we had briefly the last time you were on I was really like loaded for bear because I realized for those doctors, our colleagues who thought, you know what, it's really hard on here to do it myself, to be out on my own. I have to run under the cover of a hospital because they're going to save me and they care about me. It is a wake up call for us. They don't care about you. They, they made fun of the doctors not being able to wear a mask because it will offend the patient. 
Forget about the doctor health. Doctors and nurses being furloughed, putting positions where they're in units that they don't automatically work in, putting on a COVID union, unit when you work in physical therapy or another, it's not appropriate. But you're just grist for the mill, bodies to be moved. And as long as you make the conveyor belt work, and I could imagine, I'm not saying that I've heard it, but I can imagine coding is also in this little differential. You'd better put down COVID-19 or whatever that you code is, because that's how the hospital is going to get paid. And if you don't do it, I can imagine you can become a disruptive physician and peer reviewed and put up on databases because you don't want to play the game. That is not a position that any any human should be in, but specifically us, because we do take an oath to do no harm, to be an advocate for our patients. You want to talk about, I can imagine the, the mental distress of knowing that you're working against the interests of your patient. I can't even imagine what that's like. I would never want to be in that position. And now that people, it's like Affordable Care Act. We, you and I knew how bad it was going to be. I don't think people knew until it rolled out how bad it was going to be. This is the same position. You thought, yeah, I'm going to get a paycheck. I'm going to get 401k. I'm good. But I've heard that there's a lot of doctors where Wall Street has come and bought out the practice and they drop their their benefits. They drop their pay 20%. It is about the money for these guys. They don't care about health care. It's never been about health care. It's about control. I said this for seven or eight years. Probably one of the first people to think that way. But unfortunately, I feel like I was right. You were right. It is about control. And, you know, we talked about the philosophical divide. You and I look at each individual patient, patient as the precious, gifted soul they are and yep. what to do for them. They look at populations. They look at groups of people, not individuals. They think innovation is too expensive. They think you're too expensive at the end of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, Bill Emanuel, who said, well, I hope to die at 75 and you should too. I mean, they, the, the if you want to be a cynic, we're their worst enemy because we want to keep people alive and prolong their lives. It's very, very sad if you look at the philosophical divide. If you look at insurance companies right now, think about this. Hmm. We're not allowed to operate, operate, see patients. Patients are not going in. The insurance companies are still getting their premiums, hmm. their subsidies. They are sitting on piles of money, getting piles of interest with no outlay. I didn't even think about it like that. <laughs> They're incentive. They never want us to go back to work or patients to go in. That's right. Um, the hospitals are empty. They are sitting on a big purse. <laughs> How interesting. That's, yeah. It's like it's on what's been going on on steroids with their pre-certs and their denials. But, you know, the hospitals, I'm not crying tears for them either because they're going to get paid from from the congressional bailouts because they'll get paid based on the code. I have heard that you get paid, the hospitals will be paid more if they have a COVID patient on a respirator than they will for somebody with a heart disease, etc. That is unacceptable. And that's picking winners and choosers, picking winners and losers, sorry. And those stories that I've been kind of trickling through of primary care doctors being, telling their patients who have multiple medical problems, you know, I just have to make you comfortable. I really don't I don't have the resources to treat you. That's rationing. I mean, this is just ghoulish on, a, on an amazing level. But everybody's so focused on COVID that they can't see it unless it affects them. Then it was, there was no, like crying in the wilderness. I can't treat you. I can't get to you. They're, they're not allowing you to come to see me. I can't admit you for something that's not COVID related, really. I have to treat you as an outpatient. This is just a mess and it's not helping people and it's costing everybody more than they can even it's it's not you can't even put a price on it frankly because a life is invaluable and you're right we're once we're gone and I'm not sure if this was the goal which is to get rid of the pri the private practice physician finish us off we went from 60% to 30% how many of us can hold out I'm not able to operate either ENT is considered um, you know, elective. A lot of people want to hear it see, right? You yeah. Know, but you can go blind, you can go deaf. That's yes. Elective, you know. Can't breathe, you can't swallow. So what? You I haven't been, <laughs> I haven't I been know. able to send people for studies because they can't swallow. And like, oh yeah. no, is this really important? And my favorite was a fine needle aspiration for a thyroid, which was suspicious. It was a year ago. I want to recheck it. Well, do you really need to do it? I'm not arguing with you, but do you? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do need to do it. It's been a year. 
it was questionable. I want to know if it's cancer. What are you talking about? It was like a 10 minute conversation of him telling me how he wasn't arguing, but he was really arguing with me. And I won at the end of it because I got kind of nasty. But what is going on that we should do that? And this is. It's amazing. The things that you and I train, when we train, the things that we would do emergently are now it's just, oh, lays of fair. I feel like it's Russian roulette with it our is. patients. I, I hope you make it. You know, it, it just it's, it shocks me every single day. Uh, my daughter is a my oldest two daughters are physicians. My oldest um, is on faculty at the med school. And she has a friend that had a job and was fired, you know, let go. She was went and was employed, and they said, "Oh, it's COVID. You're fired." She's been out of pra- her residency a year. We don't have the money, you know. Um, very, you know, we're sh- we're short on doctors. Yeah, that's the uh, other thing. We are. This is going to exacerbate that. Bill is wagging the dog, and we when when they said, you know, that uh, physicians you need certificate of need that we can't start hospitals that we can do that. That's like saying guys that are mechanics can't own their own shop. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to be able to have our own hospitals, our own surgery centers. We need to be the ones running the show, being able to write the meds. We're not criminals because we want to write you for a med that we have that try it. It might help you and keep you out of the hospital. And it's been showing to do it. It's not like it's not every story that I've heard. I couldn't breathe within 12 hours within a day I was off. I didn't need the ventilator. I got off. The, I mean, this is silly on, on, on all fronts. Let's take our last break, though, because I want to get your opinion on how, if you had a chance, how you'd open up the country. Um, you're living in the solution. Welcome back to Living the Solution. We're speaking with Dr. Kristen Held. And we talked a lot about what people don't know. They don't know what it's like on the front line. They don't understand. They just think that the government has the answer and that these politicians have the answer. And, you know, this is, I'm I'm going to go back to what I always talk about and preach about is who stands to gain? Who's going to make money on us being closed? Who's going to make money on not going with the cheapest medication, the cheapest treatment, the cure perhaps? And instead of waiting a year and a half for a vaccine that may or may not work, may not cover you, as you know, this 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 virus mutates. So we know the common flu virus doesn't work. Our vaccine doesn't work all the time. Every year it changes, right? So where are we putting ourselves, our eggs in all these baskets that we already know are questionable? And the people who are proselytizing have a dog in the hunt. The NIH is in bed with the WHO, which is in bed with China, who started this whole deal. Let's be honest. This is a, this something doesn't smell right. To tell you the truth, but we are where we are right now, when we're, the country's closed. How would you start the process of opening the country? Okay. Well, the first I think we have to sit down as a nation and say we have to stop. We have to stop politicizing medicine. It, it, this is not politics. This is your life, and we need to realize it has been completely politicized and stop doing that. One side wants us to go to single-payer socialized medicine. And that is not the United States of America. And we cannot let this be the mechanism by which that happens. Um, So some of the governors, like the South Dakota governor, is allowing a study to be done that's using hydroxychloroquine to see if we can prevent this virus from spreading and uh, get people um, immune, let us have the ability to develop some immunity. But I think we have got to let, number one, stop these executive orders. CDC recommendations from the top down are not laws or mandates or edicts. The governors of each state need to stop and say, okay, time's up. We've plateaued. Uh, we have, we, we, nobody hasn't been able to get a ventilator. Um, they're done. Mm-hmm. Sir, go back to the OR. Patients, go back to your doctors. We're going to be smart. You know, the elderly, the at, at risk populations, obese, diabetics, hypertensive, wear a mask. In the offices, we, we are using the best 
clean techniques in our offices and distancing and masks. It's going to be one of the safest places you can be is in your doctor's office. So let's open up the doctor's offices. Then let's do testing when we need to. Now, I don't want to track people and label people and say, you can only go out into public if you have antibodies. Come on, folks. That's yeah. not us. If you're at risk, then let's look at treating you preventively. I, I think that there's promise in that. Let's treat our frontline uh, first responders. Let's treat our health care workers. Let's treat our at-risk patients. Let's get going um, back. Um, and we'll use the antibody testing and let's get back to life until we have a vaccine or other drugs in a year. Let's use what we've got and, um, and get back going as quickly as we can before we lose our hospitals and patients. Um, I, I hope it's not too late. I don't think it is because I think the American people, we're hardworking, we're compassionate, we're resilient. We never say die. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I think patients, have got to stand up, empower their doctors, and I think they have got to put the heat on our bureaucrats and politicians. I think you're absolutely right. And I think we, there need to be, I think children, I'm sorry, the patients have been educated about this, um, you know, telemedicine, which is not healthcare. It's a stopgap. And I've never liked it except for patients that I know have treated and they're following up with me. That's healthcare. I know you have examined you. And, you know, this is convenience. But to just start treating people you don't know, not examine them. And now the DEA is allowing people to write Schedule 4 medication. You know, that's the opioids and this sort of thing. I mean, what? who's up with them? It doesn't make any sense. So someone's going to call up a telemedicine doc, says I have back pain. Write a per it's going to be the same thing that got us into trouble in the first place. And right. who owns these telemedicine companies? It's, it's you know, it's Wall Street. It's the hedge funds. They're the ones that started this process of taking over healthcare because it was the next cash cow. And it's a money making venture for them, not about health. So when it becomes not, uh, you know, you can't make a buck on it, they're going to throw it by the wayside, let's just face it. But at that point, after you shut down the private doctors, where are patients going to go? Their only game in town is a hospital. And they've gotten too big to fail. They've put the rural doctor, I mean, the rural hospitals out of business. And it, it shouldn't cost you $2,000 for a CT there and 200 on, as an out, you know, a freestanding radiology center. So now you've just galvanized the most expensive aspects of our healthcare system. And this was the push to finish it. It was already moving that way. And I think now patients are hopefully awake, awaken to the fact, as has doc, have doctors, that if you're not in control of your own pocketbook, your own body, someone else will do it for you and you're not going to like it. Because when you hit 60 and they tell you you can't have the hip replacement or you can't get your glaucoma surgery or you can't get your nasal polyps removed because some, you know, that's where it's going. It's not going to be, I'm going to get my facelift and it's going to be awesome. You're going to get the worst, lowest denominator. But I need to be political for a second. I bet you'll be able to get a termination of pregnancy. I bet that will go on without a problem, which is unacceptable. It feels like if you have cancer... Uh, they want doctors who will write you a prescription to do yourself in at your whim. Forgot about that. Yeah. You know, come on. That is just not us. That is not American medicine. It's not where we want to go. That is not us. And um, it's not what patients, the American patient wants either. No. And I think for the people who, again, think that socialized medicine is the end all be all, we got a preview of that, didn't we? It was the public partner public private partnership that fixed it those hospitals didn't have ventilators they didn't have equipment and it took the private industry to come in and make it happen imagine if the government didn't have that imagine if it was just the system working that's a disaster i mean who would who would think that that was a good thing you know i think we are we gave them grace you know we we pray to God. You know, we, we believe in a God. That's our constitution was founded. That's where our rights come from. We were born with inalienable rights that came from God, not granted to us from some whoever's in the White House or whoever is on Capitol Hill. Um, and um, we've given them grace. We've given them weeks to a month to get their acting gear to get their ventilator shipped around and everything they want to do. And you know what? 
we're done now and we're going to get up and we're going to go back to work and we're going to treat this with how we can. And um, because that's what we do, we're going to find a cure and, and we're going to find it with our patients with what, with what we've got now. I think that's an excellent point. And if I would add to what you said about getting the country open, it would be the doctors on the front line. That, that's, that's the first line of defense. Give us those, you know, rapid testing machines in our offices where the patient's yeah. paying a fraction and they can see us tomorrow instead of having to wait in a, in a line to get into a hospital. It doesn't make any sense. Once we, and I think the president has said it very eloquently. If you have a pill that works or medication that works, why are you waiting for a vaccine? There's no reason to wait for a vaccine to open up the country. There, you follow the money. That's an, a nonsensical response. When you have treatment, and I would say that the NIH also did studies on hydroxychloroquine and coronavirus in monkeys in 2014, and they found that it was helpful. So all of a sudden, when it's you know when it actually works, you don't know, and oh, it's not proven. I mean, come on now, and it's it doesn't make sense at all. And it's, as you said, damaging, doing untold damage to the psyche, to the health, to the, the pocketbook. And I think we are resilient as a country. But every person that hasn't been able to weather it, that had to go down and not have their come, I, I pray for them. We're all in that situation, too. You and I are solo practitioners. And it's been a challenge. And I've trusted in God and it'll work out. But I hope when it works out that people wake up and that they get discernment and that they decide that I want to be in control of my life. And personal responsibility does come into play. You have choices. And if you want the people, we've seen what they're going to do. They're not going to let you sing in church. They're not going to let you congregate in your car. They're not going to let you go into buy seeds to grow your own garden. I mean, how does that have to do with coronavirus? I'm just confused about that. Unreal, unreal. And, um, you know, it's going to take, they've got to stop censoring us. They, We've got to start speaking up um, because that's what we're called to do. I don't think there's any best, that's, I can't even put a bow on that one. You just finished it for me. So I want people to know how they can, because you write and you, you wrote an excellent piece in The Hill. People need to go and read that. Where else yeah. can they find stuff that you've done? Okay, so um, if you go to aapsonline.org, we have anybody can join AAPS for free if you're not a physician. If you just want to be a patient member, um, we have a, just reams of information and can answer questions for you. If you're on Twitter, you can follow me at Chris Held MD. It's KKS Held, and I'll answer you back. I have a blog that's Chris Held MD. WordPress.com. And, um, it's, it, it'd be easy to reach me. You can, you can reach me through my office in San Antonio at Stone Oak. Uh, our website is stoneoakeyes.com. And, um, you know, we're here for you. I mean, you, you're an ENT. I'm an ophthalmologist. We were, we're physicians first. We took that oath. And before we could do our surgical specialty, we did everything else. <laughs> and, uh, we still do. It's in our hearts. It, it's just, we, we've been there. We walked that right of passage and, and we're going to. We're we're not going to let anybody take it from us or our patients. Yep. And now it's time for our colleagues to stand up on their hind legs like we are and yep. start to take our power back. It's the mantra of my show. We yep. have the power. They can't do it without us. We're seeing how this works. We're letting all these other entities just insert themselves. They know nothing. We could do this cheaper, faster, more efficiently, and they need to start asking for us. But even if they don't, we need to take it back and prove it, right? Don't wait for anybody else. Do it yourself. Uh, on that note, thank you, Chris, for joining me today. I really, I love having you on. I can't wait to have you on again. I love having being on. Thank you so much. I miss you. I know. We got to get together when all this is done. I'm looking forward to seeing you. All right. Have Bye. a great day. Take care. And thank you for leaving in the solution. Revolutionary talk for revolutionary times. Liberty Talk events.